Just when you think you have it all figured out, we've got one more layer of complexity to add in. Unfortunately, this layer is not as obscure as some of our recent conversations have been. In fact, this topic is the norm for business today. And our topic today has to do with foreign exchange transactions. To lighten up the subject a little, though, I thought I'd weave in a story about one of my recent trips to the U.S. with our good friend Bob. Now, the story begins with Bob's phone ringing. His contact down in the U.S. has heard of a sweetheart deal that Bob can't pass up. By the way, if I haven't mentioned it yet, Bob is a Canadian. And Parent Corporation is a Canadian corporation. His U.S. contact goes on to tell him about a land auction happening in Texas. Half the lots of an entire town are up for bankruptcy sale. The deal comes with a championship golf course, luxury condominiums, and a horse track. And best of all, with the housing industry the way it is right now, it's expected to go for cheap. The only catch was that the auction was tomorrow, and doing any sort of due diligence would not be possible. Bob opened the attachment to the email and saw the layout of the property. Impressive, to be certain. But where the heck is Navasota, Texas, anyway? Bob got onto Google Maps and quickly found his way to the small city. Navasota was midway between College Station home of Texas A&M University, and Houston. Surely with these two populations on either side, demographics would favor this property sooner or later. Bob hopped on the first flight to Texas. He arrived on December 15th of year one and made his way to the capital city of the county of Grimes, a place called Anderson, and it was here that he was to participate in a court-supervised auction for the property. Now Anderson's only about an hour's drive from Houston and another 45 minutes away from College Station. However, as Bob drove up the main street of Anderson, he questioned really what century he was actually in. The streets were empty and nary a soul be seen. But with no time to waste, he made his way to the top of Main Street and the county courthouse. The auction was just getting underway. I wonder if Bob's going to win. Oh. And yes, Bob wins the auction for a paltry million dollars. And before Bob knew it, he was the new proud owner of a property aptly named Blue Bonnet Country after the abundance of this type of flower in this part of the state. Being a million dollars lighter, he needed to retain legal counsel. After a quick inquiry of a passing gentleman on horseback, he was directed to the town's lawyer in an office behind the courthouse. Really? Are you kidding? Anyway, what choice did he have? He hired the lawyer and was off to the county office to register his deed. With his deed in hand, he was next off to the bank to set up an account. He still needed to arrange payment for his purchase. So this is what a bank looked like a hundred years ago. With a million dollars due in 30 days, Bob was concerned that he was going to be exposed to currency risk between now and then. So he talked to the teller about entering into a forward contract to buy a million U.S. dollars with U.S. Bank. With that little piece of business behind him, it was time to see the property. Now, I know this has nothing to do with really hard accounting, but for the sake of a story, aren't you just a little bit interested to see what he bought? Ah, the town entrance. There it is. There it is. Bob was on the edge of his driver's seat. Hmm. Well, at least the grass is cut. Let's see. This should be the horse track. Then came the drive up Main Street. And then along Blue Bonnet Boulevard. It's a good thing we rented a 4x4. Is that a domestic dog or wild? Let's see now. The community center? Bob well, was starting to get a little worried. The last stop was the golf course, convention center, and luxury condos. All he wanted to do was to kick back and relax after the day he's had. The golf course looked really nice, but there wasn't a soul to be seen. He arrived at the clubhouse and quickly figured out why no one was golfing. Now about that clubhouse and convention center, and the luxury condominiums, ugh, we needed a nap. However, on second thought, we've got to unload this place as quickly as we can. So let's start looking at the accounting implications of the first few transactions that arose in Blue Bonnet. 
Note that Blue Bonnet is a U.S. division of Parent Corporation. This may or may not be the best way to structure this transaction. It's more common for foreign operations to be structured and owned in separate foreign legal entities for legal and tax reasons. But given the short timeline that Bob was working on, he didn't have any time to do that in this situation. So Parent Corporation is now engaged in two separate activities, Canadian Investments and the U.S. Land Operations. And because PICO is a Canadian corporation, the foreign currency of PICO is the Canadian dollars as it is the presentation currency. Now this is a pretty busy chart, and to date we've only really been dealing with the first column in this chart. And in this lesson, we're going to tackle the second column, the International Division. In later lessons, we'll tackle the columns on the right-hand side of this chart, which deal with having a foreign subsidiary. Now in the rows down this chart, there's some new definitions. The transaction denomination is the currency used to transact for goods and services. For example, I could be a Canadian supplier issuing invoices in US dollars, or just as easily purchasing raw materials denominated in Euros. The recording currency is the currency used to maintain the internal records. Often this aligns with the country in which the company is incorporated and operates. The functional currency, however, is the key one to understand because this is the currency that is intended to reflect the economic environment in which the entity operates. Also, we have the presentation currency, which is used to report results to our primary stakeholders, which are most often investors and lenders. Note that this does not necessarily need to be the same thing as our functional currency. So for instance, consider companies that are domiciled, say in Canada, but listed on a U.S. stock exchange. The little arrows with the T's and the C's in the third, fourth, and fifth columns indicate the method of translation. T stands for the temporal method, where C stands for the current rate method. For the time being, we're going to leave this aside and focus on the second column for this lesson. But you'll see this chart again in future lessons. Identifying the functional currency is a key to recording transactions from a gap perspective. And to do this, IAS 21 provides us with some guidance. IAS 21 helps to identify the appropriate functional currency by looking at various indicators. Now, generally speaking, if a business operates as an extension of a domestic company, then the domestic currency is likely the functional currency, which is probably most likely the case here because Blue Bonnet Country is an extension of parent corporation. However, where the domestic company seeds the foreign operation and then after that lets it run relatively autonomously, then the local currency of that country is likely to be the functional currency. The first two indicators on this list, the sales prices and the operating costs, are given priority over the others in making this determination. You need to be able to distinguish between the different types of assets and liabilities on the balance sheet using one of two classifications. The reason this distinction is important is that it drives the relevant translation rate. Monetary items are always translated at the most current exchange rate. However, for non-monetary items, the answer will vary depending on the functional currency and the presentation currency. But we'll leave distinguishing this item until a future lesson. Exchange rates can get confusing, and to be honest, it always takes me an extra second or two to get it straight in my head what we're talking about. But essentially, the way I keep exchange rates straight is to think and talk about the exchange rates in terms of buying a unit of foreign exchange or selling a unit of foreign exchange. So the rate quoted here would be the cost for buying one US dollar. So for instance, it costs one spot 05 to buy one US dollar. I could also equally say that it would cost zero spot 95 US dollars to buy one Canadian dollar. It's simply the inverse. We need to track three different rates for the purpose of translating foreign currency transactions. The historical rate is the spot rate on the transaction. The closing rate is the spot rate at the period end reporting date. And the forward rate is the rate agreed to for the exchange of currencies at a future date. Now, have you got all this straight in your head? Are you ready to get back to Bob?
The dilemma Bob faces right now is that he has a million dollar obligation coming due in 30 days. And the question he has to ask himself is whether or not he wants to be exposed to currency risk. Currency rates trade around the clock, sometimes rising, sometimes falling. In volatile markets, they move may be significant. Bob's $1 million obligation could end up costing much more or less than what he thought he was paying when he won the auction on the steps of the Grimes County Courthouse. Let's say that Bob likes living dangerously and decides to just see what happens. What's the risk he faces? Well, that the Canadian dollar weakens in the next 30 days. Let's take a look at the journal entries to reflect this approach. As soon as those words were out of the judge's mouth, Bob had his first journal entry to record. The purchase of the project can be capitalized to one account, which we'll call Land Development Project for now. Note that this asset account is recorded in Canadian dollars at the December 15th spot rate. However, keep in mind that the payable to Grimes County is denominated in U.S. dollars. So to help us remember, I've just put a U.S. dollars in brackets after the account name. At the year-end date, the monetary liabilities, which in this case is the payable to Grimes County, must be adjusted to reflect the closing rate, that is the spot rate of 1 spot 03. As the Canadian dollar is strengthened, parent corporation realizes a gain through regular income. If this liability was settled at this date, then parent corporation would in essence settle this liability to acquire Blue Country for $1,030,000. If we took a snapshot of the financial statements at this time, parent corporation would show the land development project on the books for $1,050,000 the liability to the county for $1,030,000 and a foreign exchange gain on the income statement of $20,000. A couple of more weeks pass and then comes to the faithful day where PICO has to make payment for the land development project. Only this time the US dollar has strengthened against the Canadian dollar to 1 spot 07. This results in a $40,000 loss in the 15 days since year end. Foreign currency swings can be fickle that way. So once again, if this all happens in year two, the financial results would reflect the settlement of the liability and a $40,000 foreign exchange loss through regular income. Simple enough, right? Let's look at this one more time, and only this time, assume that Bob doesn't want to gamble on the foreign currency risk and he wants to lock in his purchase price for Blue Bonnet Country. He's able to do this by entering into an agreement with the bank to purchase the $1 million US at a fixed rate in 30 days time. Of course, the risk here is that the Canadian dollar strengthens, in which case parent corporation would forego the potential exchange gains. Sometimes having certainty is a comforting feeling. But between you and me, I think Bob might be in a little deep already and doesn't want to compound his issues. Now as soon as this sort of decision is made, parent corporation is hedging its position. Hedging means to take a particular risk out of the equation, in this case foreign exchange risk. There are two types of hedges we need to learn about. The first is called a fair value hedge, and this is used to hedge something that already exists on the books, in this case the liability to Grimes County. The second type of hedge is a cash flow hedge, and we'll look at that in our next lesson. The story here is the same. At the date of acquisition, we record the purchase in Blue Bonnet Country at the spot rate on that day. Now on the same day we witnessed Bob visiting the local bank and purchasing a forward contract to buy 1 million US dollars in 30 days time, locked in at a forward rate of 1 spot 06. Now to record this contract we set up a receivable from the bank denominated in US dollars and a payable to the bank in Canadian dollars. Having the two separate accounts set up like this is called the gross method of accounting. We could also use one account and only show the net differences, which would be the net method of accounting. Regardless, for financial reporting purposes, the two accounts will be offset against one another and only a net position reflected in the financial statements. The difference between the forward rate and the spot rate at inception represents the cost to enter into the hedge. Bob will pay $10,000 for the peace of mind that he will know with certainty how much his investment in Blue Bonnet Country will cost. The cost of the hedge will be brought into income over the term of the forward contract, as we'll see next. 
At the year end date, we need to translate all of our monetary assets and liabilities at the closing rate. For our payable to grind counties, this results in a $20,000 foreign exchange gain, which is the same as what we saw in our previous example. However, we also need to adjust the forward contract to ensure it reflects the closing forward rate on this date, which just so happens to be 1 spot 035 for a similar 15 day contract. The Canadian dollar has strengthened and as a result the fair value of our US denominator receivable from the bank has deteriorated, causing us to report a $25,000 foreign exchange loss. So what does this mean when we look at the transactions in their totality? Well, we have our land carried on the books of parent corporation at historical cost, unaffected by the fluctuating exchange rates. The receivable from US bank denominated in US dollars has declined in value reflecting the strengthening of the Canadian dollar. The US dollar just isn't worth what it was when we entered into the contract. The receivable is offset by our payment commitment to the US bank of $1,060,000 which hasn't changed. Why? Well because it's denominated in Canadian dollars and it's not supposed to change. Our payable to Grimes County has gone down from the original $1,050,000 to the current $1,030,000. And that's a good thing. And how did that happen? Well, for the very same reason our receivable from the US bank went down, the Canadian dollar strengthened. Which brings us to the income statement. And here we find that the net foreign exchange loss amounts to $5,000. The gain on the decline in the payable to Grimes County is offset by the loss on the receivable from US bank. The only reason these two did not offset entirely was because there was a cost of setting up the hedge in the first place. And the $5,000 represents a portion of that hedge cost getting recognized into income. So in a fair value hedge, the gain or loss on the change in the value of the foreign contract, which is also called the hedging instrument, offsets the gain or loss on the foreign denominated asset or liability, in this case a payable to Grimes County which is called the hedged item. Let's jump forward to the settlement date 15 days later. First, Bob needs to deliver the promised $1,060,000 to US Bank. This relieves that payable. For its part, US Bank gives Bob a cashier's check denominated in US dollars for $1,000,000. That is worth $1,070,000 on this date. With the weakening of the Canadian dollar in the 15 days since year end, this looks pretty good as Pico will record a $35,000 gain. But remember what we saw at year end. You can bet your US dollar that there's probably an offsetting loss to be recorded somewhere else. Bob takes the 1 million US dollars and drives over to Anderson and delivers the money to the county clerk himself. This relieves Pico's books of the $1,030,000 it had recorded as the liability. And to true things up, as expected, there's a $40,000 foreign exchange loss. So much for our exchange gain. Easy come, easy go in the world of hedges. If nothing else happens in year two, Pico's general ledger will reflect these amounts. Land is still recorded at its historical cost. The cash account is $1,060,000 poorer. And that was the amount we wanted to spend in the first place. And our income statement picks up the foreign exchange loss which is the other half of the initial cost to establish the hedge. The exchange gains and losses for the liability to Grams County and the forward contract offset as they are supposed to. So when all is said and done, we can compare the two alternatives. In the first case, Bob decided to accept the currency risk and this just happened to result in a loss of $20,000. In the second case, he hedged his exposure, realizing a 10,000 foreign currency loss, which was the cost to establish the hedge. So there you have it. How to account for foreign currency transactions and fair value hedges. In our next lesson, we will look at the other type of hedge we identified, the cash flow hedge. So until then, don't stop to get to the top. When you get to the top, don't stop.